coming up next on the health hustle if you feel in your body you need to do it freaking do it like don't let anything stand in your way and you know take out loans do what you need to do keep working another job you know have that one be your side hustle (laughs) and don't stop because there's people out there that need you and that's some of the that's what kind of helps me sometimes get through perfectionism is that like if I'm sitting here scrolling on my phone and avoiding what I have to do, I'm not helping people. I'm not in integrity. And so if you feel really called to be out there helping people and knowing that even you, like, even if you just change, I'm going to cry for some reason, like one person's life, it's worth it. I don't know why I just got choked up. Um, it's, <laughs> there it is. Yeah, there's the empathy. Even if you just change one person's life, I feel like it's worth it. And I feel like we all know something that is enough to help other people. Like, don't underestimate yourself that like comparing this person knows more than me. Every, there's a lot of people out there that know more than me. But there's something that you have that's unique. Like you can reach a certain person in a special way. And the like getting out of that comparison mind like focus on your eyes on your own journey because you're wasting time what's up y'all Corey here and on this episode i had a chance to sit down with daniel hamilton daniel used to be a speech pathologist but now is a functional nutritional therapy practitioner specializing in blood sugar and hypoglycemia She became obsessed with nutrition while having her own personal battle of PCOS, which she was able to reverse by learning about blood sugar and insulin. Danny is also the host of her own podcast show, which one of my favorite things to do is to bring on other podcasts. Her show is called Unlock the Sugar Shackles. Some of the things that we get into on this episode, though, are why she got into speech therapy in the first place, how she made the pivot into nutrition, some of her early mentorship moments, her deep-rooted empathy and desire to help others, creating shareable content, working for free, or should you not work for free, the rule of 100, a rapid fire question round, and so much more. One last thing, if you're a health or fitness professional and you're having difficulties getting leads, one of the most common reasons that I see this is not having a well-defined niche. If you go to the link in the description, I have a free three-step process that walks you through exactly how to get clarity on which niche is best suited for you and your business. Without further ado, mm, let's go. Danny Hamilton, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Happy to be here. I'm excited because we both have a history in allied health professionals and have managed to find our way out of it. And now here we are today doing our own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Really excited. It's so funny when you said, oh, you're a speechy. I was like, (laughs) you have to know either somebody, your a a girlfriend was a speech therapist, somebody, you know something. (laughs) And so you were an OT. Yeah. What, what did you do in the OT world? My brother's an OT. I was outpatient orthopedics. Um, mm-hmm. I did a small stint in pediatrics, but honestly, like it was not for me. That yeah. was that's uh, a whole new world. Oh yeah, it was yeah. a soul suck, no question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. That's how I felt about long term term care facilities, doing dysphagia, swallowing treatment, giving, basically giving old people pureed diets, and it was mostly advocating for them Mm. you know the whole time I felt like my brain was turning into puree and (laughs) so I went back to working with kids and that was yeah how many times a day can you sing the wheels on the bus and blow bubbles and (laughs) okay I don't want to do that (laughs) no what's funny about that is I'll never forget I did a a pediatrics rotation at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester and it was like one of the early things that we had to do was we had to sing twinkle twinkle little star and I remember just like my soul (laughs) leaving my body I was like this is so not me no. Like, I do not want to sing this song right now. <laughs> At all. It was, yeah, it was hard to, like, I felt like every day I had to be a clown. Mm. And it took a lot out of me <laughs> yeah. to do. And that wasn't the only clientele that I worked with. But it definitely wasn't where my heart was. No, <laughs> for sure. I, I resonate with that a lot. Because you got into it because you would correct people's grammar. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. When I was a young child, maybe like six or seven years old, uh, I remember my mom was picking me up from a friend's house and my friend's mom said something like, oh, you guys should have went here. I was like, it's I should have gone, not I should have went. And my mom's like, Danielle, you can't correct people. I'm like, but you correct me. And she's like, I'm an adult. You cannot correct adults. I was like, oh, okay. So I I was just always tuned into like accents. And if someone had some sort of a speech impediment on the TV, I would always just, I was very attuned to it. So when I heard of the profession of speech pathology, my mom's like, oh, why don't you do that? I was like, oh, okay, cool. That sounds fun. And Mm -hmm. I liked learning about the phonetics and the phone names. But after beyond that, just the career was such a letdown and how your salary was so capped and everything was so 
determined by insurance reimbursement and you couldn't make more and then you were salaried to try to get benefits but then you always had to work per diem jobs and it was like I was working all the time paying off a hundred thousand dollars of loans and just wasn't seeing anything for it I was just struggling and yeah and then that's when I had a breakdown in my health when I was at the same time working in the nursing homes and I just kind of saw I was taking, you know, five medications, multiple inhalers, getting all these allergy shots. I was a hot mess in my early 20s. And I just saw this like little dotted line to my patients around me in the nursing home, like, oh my goodness, they have all these medications. They have all these diagnoses, but they're in their 70s and 80s. And I was like, if something doesn't change, this is going to be my future. And I just, that didn't sit well with me. And I just knew that there had to have been another way. (laughs) So I'm curious as to the language piece of it and your correcting of grammar. What Mm -hmm. was it about that that attracted you? And do you still do that today? I do not correct people's grammar. Maybe silently online if I'm reading it, I'm like, you spelled they wrong. But (laughs) (laughs) it's just, it's just natural. I'm not judging you because I know that we all have our own strengths and I just happen, that happens to come to me, (laughs) you know, but um, like do, so the, the language aspect of it. So in speech pathology, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of kids have language disorders. So they'll say, little kiddos will say, like he, instead of saying she. So they don't understand, well, pronouns, or they might not know how to use plurals, or they might not use past tense correctly. And so there's lots of language elements that you have to work with in all stages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I became fascinated with the language piece of things when I had a guy on, uh, Joe Cochran, shout out to him. And we were just talking about um, just how powerful the words are that we use, like from even from a language standpoint is like the meaning behind the words and how we associate those words is such a powerful thing. And I tell people this all the time is like, you're essentially speaking to your subconscious based on the words that you use and the language that you use. And so I'm just curious as to like how you got interested in it. If it was, or maybe it just was like the correcting of grammars and just noticing ticks. Yeah, it was more like, oh, you know, I used to, like, there's home videos of me being like, cousin Nikki said puntin instead of pumpkin or something <laughs> like that. Like, I'm like, oh my goodness, I was still like tuned into this when I was really little. And so it just made sense. But that wasn't the only thing. Like, I wasn't only working with people with articulation mm. issues and grammar issues. Sure. It went well beyond that. But unfortunately, I feel like I don't know of that many skills that I got from speech therapy that really crossed over into what I do today. A lot of people will be like, oh, I worked in communications and marketing and business. I'm like, yeah, I I was singing wheels on the bus, you know, (laughs) like baby sign language, you know, not nothing to do with what I'm doing now. But I did one of the things that when I was learning about Uh, nutrition, I was working with kids on the spectrum and I was dying to tell the parents like, oh my goodness, there's so much we could do to improve their functioning if we change some of the foods that we're eating, they're eating. And, but I wasn't legally allowed to say that, but some of the parents I got really close with. And I was like, I wonder what would happen, wink, wink, if they didn't get their bottle of powdered milk, you know, all week. And I mean, the changes that I would see sometimes would have taken four years of speech therapy Mm. to get a change that you would get in one week. Like a child just running across the room, laughing, not even knowing that I'm in the room, no matter how many times I scream his name, bubbles, like trying to get his attention. Then fast forward to the next week, he's sitting in front of me, joint attention, playing, laughing with me. It was like, this is a different child. Mm. I mean, and that was just from taking away a bottle. It was amazing. But I did want to work with kids on the spectrum, but... They have such picky eating tendencies. I wasn't a feeding therapist. There's all these texture aversions. And so it's like, it was hard because I sort of knew a lot of things that they should do, but it was hard to get them to do those things. So it, I, I, I changed gears. <laughs> yeah. Food is medicine, as the quote is often said. I don't know who said it, but I do know that as a quote. Um, I want to get more into your personal health journey and how you got into what you're doing today. But before we do, I want to kind of circle back a little bit in something you said about how uh, you were essentially frustrated with like being stuck in this system. You didn't feel like you'd really practice how you wanted to practice. You couldn't even really talk about nutrition because of out of scope, as I'm sure somebody would say. Yeah. So what were maybe those early days of speech like? And like, when did you start to put the dots together of like, I need to do something outside of the healthcare system? Wow. Well, no one's ever asked me this before. <laughs> so I guess um, I started 
maybe if I tell a little bit of my journey, I'll, I'll, I'll find it. Um, but I, I know that when I was in the nursing home, that's when I got a hold of Rob Wolf's book, The Paleo Diet Solution. And I read that book and I just was like, totally mind blown. I wanted to shout it from the rooftops like, oh my God, we've been lied to and don't eat that pizza. It's like processed. It's whatever. Like I wanted to just save everybody. Right. And so I was really excited. And at the same time, the paleo diet like healed all my asthma, allergies, sinus infections. Just it was amazing at how much my health transformed from just switching to real food as opposed to processed food. And then I was and then I went to nutritional therapy school. I had still wanted to be helping people. And I was doing all these other sort of programs, but nothing official. But it was in 2018 that I finally pulled the trigger to go to nutritional therapy school. And it was once I made that decision, I was like, this is what I want to do. I can't wait to be able to do it. And it was almost like that's when my mind finally opened to the idea of, oh my gosh, I can do something else. Mm. But I had to work my way out of it because I was still having to pay, you know, a thousand dollars in loans every month and pay all my bills. And I wasn't able to just quit it. And so I really had to build this whole thing up in the background. And that was really challenging because it was the more I stepped into accepting, like, I want to do something with nutrition and I really want to do this. I want to be the person with a podcast and an Instagram following, like all the other people who have helped me. Totally. I was just dying to do that. And every job felt so painful. And I switched jobs all the time because I just couldn't deal with them anymore. I'm like, ah, oh, maybe this next one will, will be better. Or it's just like, you know, same shit, different pile. So it's a little more interesting for a second. But it was really just, it was, it felt like, and especially because I couldn't really legally talk about nutrition, it just felt like for for years, I was just mm-hmm. being like stifled totally. that like someone was putting their hand in front of my mouth, like, you can't do this, you can't say this. And I'm like, I can help them so much more. And it was really hard to not be able to help people with all of the information that I knew. And it just, it felt really unfair. (laughs) I can echo your statement so ridiculously close. I literally just today posted about the two words that literally changed my life was um, a book that I read by James Altucher, and it's called Choose Yourself. And I'll never forget, I was working as an occupational therapist and I was looking for the next job or debating if I needed another certification or a different degree and never really feeling like anything I was doing was really making a difference. I was stuck into a system, no matter how good of an OTI I was, I never really felt like I could make more money or have a bigger impact. And it was like those words, those two words, choose yourself, literally fundamentally changed me as a person. And it opened the door to the idea of like, maybe I don't need permission from somebody else to do the things I want to do. Maybe I don't need to play by this like this rule or this system or the game that I've been jammed into and maybe I can take a different path. So I can totally get what you're saying. Yeah, a hundred percent. I relate to that so much. And I also remember that one of the things that was a little scary for me was that I didn't know any entrepreneurs. I didn't know anyone who owned a business. And so I was just, you know, my dad's a mechanic, my mom's a secretary, like that's what I grew up around. And, you know, it's like, get a good job with benefits and, you know, all these things like, you know, I was doing better than my parents because I had a college degree, I had a master's degree, but I didn't feel like I was using my brain and I didn't feel like there was anything, the harder I worked, it was just the harder I worked. I didn't get rewarded for that. So I worked so much harder in school because I was getting graded. And then I come to to work and it was just, my clients would show up and I would do the best I could for them, but I wasn't going and looking up stuff for them. And I wasn't, and I didn't like that about myself. I'm like, I'm not showing up as this authentic version of myself who has all this integrity. And it was like, why am I not? It's like, because I'm in the wrong field. Like my heart just wasn't in it. Mm. You know, I was doing what I could. I really cared for my patients, but it wasn't, it didn't motivate me to do much more than that. And so, yeah, that not knowing any other entrepreneurs, not knowing how it would look. I just, once I accepted it, I just knew that I couldn't not do it. And I was like, I know how to talk about this stuff. I know so much information that could help people. I don't know everything. And I only have a nutritional therapy practitioner certificate. I don't even have a license number or anything like that, but I know more than 
what some other people know and just that like and honestly it's just for me like I need to get this out so when I started my podcast it was finally it was so liberating to finally be like I can just yell into this mic into the abyss and the people who actually want to listen are going to listen I'm not like sitting at a dinner table where people are like please stop talking about this (laughs) you know and it was like people who wanted to hear me so that felt really good it felt really aligned And then just one more short story. Um, I actually was, um, a while back, I found my old speech therapy badge from a job I had back in in Florida, and I was looking at it, and it was sitting on the table. I was like, ugh, like weird memories. Like I got kind of like a chill. And, you know, I was thinking about the office that I had. There were no windows, and it was like, oh, my gosh, I just didn't want to be doing that. And... That day, I had taken a nap, which was very rare for me, and I took a nap, and I had this like sort of like a lucid dream that I was back at work being a speech therapist. I'm like, how many days a week am I doing this? Like, I don't have time for this. I have a business to run, and I quit, like on the spot. <laughs> and I talked about it with my therapist, and and we went into like, she's like, how did you feel? And I was like crying, like, oh my God, it was, it was so, it felt so bad to having to have to do something that like my heart wasn't in and Mm. not be able to help people like I really just want to help people because I was suffering so much and I felt like there was no hope and I just don't want people to feel like that maybe it's codependency maybe it's not may I just I do just want to help people feel better and I think that at least people deserve to know information so they can make the best choice for themselves so it felt really bad to not be able to do that for so long Damn. Uh, did we just become best friends? <laughs> Seriously, though, our stories are obnoxiously similar. That's so funny. Like, I, all the emotions and all the, the mental games that you had to go through are the same hurdles that I had to go through as well. Again, I didn't even have any really anybody in my life that was an entrepreneur either, mm-hmm. which I'm curious to that question, which, uh, do you remember the first, like, business owner, entrepreneur that you met? And I'll give you a second to think about that, because I'll never forget mine. He was a guy back in Minnesota where I used to practice And he wasn't doing anything like obnoxiously amazing. He basically just created a, he was fixing potholes in Minnesota because winter is a big deal. Potholes happen. He was fixing potholes, but it was his first business. And this guy was in his, probably his sixties. And he said something to me that I'll never forget. And this was like the first, what I felt like was like a legitimate business owner, entrepreneur. And he said, this is the hardest I've ever worked, but the most fulfilled I've ever felt by my work. And when he said that to me, I was like, I want to know what that feels like because right now that is not what I feel like. I hate going to work. <laughs> wow. So Okay, so two people are coming to mind. One person who I didn't, well, I did meet her in person um, and she was sort of my inspiration for all of this because when I was really in the paleo sphere in that world, so obsessed with it because it healed me, um, there was a book by Diane Sanfilippo and I followed her. I listened to her podcast. I followed her online and I was like, oh my gosh, she's just like, a couple of years older than me and she did all this like I could do this I mean maybe I can't do it quite as well as she did her book is a masterpiece and I would never try to recreate that but I was like all of a sudden like oh my goodness I could do something like this and I used to hear her talk and just her lifestyle was so different and she'd be coming to Austin and I heard about Picnic through her podcast in 2012 and I was like I have to go to Austin that's where paleo FX is and that's where you can go to to a paleo restaurant and I I've always had Austin like literally like pinned in my mind because of that but I saw her and and then I threw a book release party for her for her 21 day sugar detox party and I was like so starstruck because I'm like oh my gosh this like amazing person she's helped me so much and I wanted to be just like her you know and And then the person who I met who was an entrepreneur in person, I met her also in New York City when I was there for like a little stint when I was really into paleo. And she's a nutritionist and she had her own website. And I went to her website being like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like, this is what I want to do. And I just couldn't believe that she was really doing it. So Mm -hmm. I felt this like sense of awe being in her presence and also the feeling that okay, if she can do this, I can do this. Like there's nothing about what these people are doing that are so unattainable, you know, like, and I graduated at the top of my class and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to have to figure it out. And that's what I, that's what entrepreneurship is. It's like, keep trying to figure stuff out. Just there's a problem, solve it, go to the next. That's what it is. So it's about not 
giving up, <laughs> I guess. And yeah. And that person, that nutritionist actually connected me with Molly mm. Eastman, yep. who you have interviewed yeah. and which is probably why I'm here in Austin today. So yeah. it was a whole little nutrition world. <laughs> I love Molly. She's a vibe. Yeah, she is. She's one of the most high energy people I think I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to tap on the fact that you were getting around people that you initially uh, admired and then it made it feel more realistic to you. I think that that's drastically underestimated by most people. I think there's so much value in getting around those people and recognizing that they're just humans like everybody else and anything you see them do from a content standpoint or a book standpoint or whatever it is, is attainable and it feels it, but it doesn't feel attainable until you like get in their presence or you spend time with them and then you're like, Oh, they're like everybody else. Yeah. I, I also, I met Diane at, uh, John Durant's, uh, book release party. I don't know if you've interviewed him. He lives here in Austin too. He wrote a book. And so it was crazy to meet these people who I've read their books and it's Mm -hmm. like, Oh my goodness. And I look at them more as celebrities, but it's, they are, you know, now I'm on their podcasts and they're on my podcast and it's like, Oh my goodness. It feels like, I don't feel like I'm in this realm that I mentally put them in. I just feel like I'm still myself. (laughs) I'm just talking on other people's podcasts. So it feels, it can look super unattainable. Just as you said, it looks like, oh, that's them. And I'm just here in my house. Like it's, it's still the same thing, you know, like you just keep building, keep learning and keep getting in touch with people. I think one of the most helpful things that happened with me early on is that there were two people who I met virtually. This was the time of COVID. That's when I, my business went live, was during COVID. And I met them and they were like, do you want to do a co-working kind of thing, mastermind thing? And it was cool to finally talk about my business with other people because I had really been in just my own little world. And so getting people who are sort of on the same level of business ish that you are at is also really helpful because then you can support each other and it feels like okay this is more real you know this is not a side hustle and I don't you know if if you're really trying to make it happen like nutrition for me was never a side hustle it was I'm trying to build my business so I can get rid of this speech therapy thing so do you mind tapping on when you knew that you wanted to leave speech therapy and then also like what that day looked like Hmm. I don't remember the exact day. I do. Was there a moment where you were like, all right, this is it. I'm done. I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. I mean, as soon as I made the decision to uh, join, to sign up for the Nutritional Therapy Association, it all became really real Mm. for me. So other people were in the program and I felt like. What got you over the edge to sign up for that program? I think it was the support of my wife Hmm. because my mom, my dad, and my brother, love them to death, uh, they are very much in that nine to five kind of thing and it was scary for them. So even as I was sharing like, I'm getting close to being able to give my, you know, my three weeks notice and I'm like, I'm, I'm almost ready to do this. And they're like, are you sure? And oh, do you, do you really think like, it's going to be okay? Like, do you, do you want to like, make sure you kind of keep this on the back end? Do you want to keep your license going? I'm like, no, I'm letting my license lapse. I not, I'm not doing that. Like, it's not an option anymore. I just wanted to burn all my bridges because I just, I don't know. There's, I think there's a difference between wanting and knowing. Hmm. And I just felt like I just knew this is what I wanted to do. So there was just no stopping me (laughs) because I was, I was really propelled from being, from how bad I felt doing something that I wasn't meant to do. I think a phrase that I've recently discovered, which I think is aligned with what you're talking about is that there's a difference between can you do it and will you do it? Mm, Yes. I think it's so easy for us to be like, yeah, I could run a marathon or like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I could start a business or like, yeah, I could get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. But it's like that. I'm not asking, can you, will you like, that's a completely different question. Will you start a business? Yeah. Will you run a marathon? Will you get a spouse? Like those are completely different ways of looking at it. Yeah. I, I feel like how I coach my clients sometimes is, you know, there's no failure. Like everyone, I I work with people with blood sugar stuff. And so, you know, I tell them inevitably, you are going to eat the ice cream. You're going to have the pizza. You're going to have whatever it is. It's not a failure. It's only a failure if you stop and abort. 
that's it. That's the only possible way you can fail. So if you just keep going, if you keep, and one of the things that's the most helpful is when you have those moments where something didn't work out quite as well as you'd hoped, you have to learn from it. That's where it's like, okay, let's assess what went wrong, what went right, what would I do again? Why did I end up like, you know, having this issue? You have to, of course, really learn from all these things. But if you just keep moving forward, you just, I feel like you can't fail. Mm. I don't know. Maybe that's wrong thinking, but it's just a matter of uh, choosing that I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to stop until I reach this goal. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. A mantra that served me well for many years now is uh, I can't lose if I don't quit. Mm -hmm. I think about that all the time on the days where it's like, I don't want to do another piece of content or I don't want to get another client call or I don't want to do this workout. I always remind myself is like, I can't lose if I don't quit. So yeah, I think that's great. Love it. Um, so in terms of the early days, I guess you could say, of starting the practice, you left speech therapy, you went to school, you got some training. What were maybe some of those earlier days like? And what were maybe some of the lessons learned from just getting started when you decided to, since you had no experience, right? Like you had no background, nobody in your family that's done it, you never really seen it. Like, how did you figure that out? So I guess I kind of went with what I knew, which was therapy. So it was the one-on-one session of helping people. So that's what I tried to do. So I tried to, I knew I needed to get clients first. And to do that, I I followed some people online and they were talking about, there was a program called Instapreneur. And so it was like how to build your Instagram and become an entrepreneur. And this was the way. And so I, right from the get go, started working on my Instagram because I thought that this is where I'm going to share information and where people are going to follow me and find me. So that's my traffic source. So, and I had had many Instagram names before that, a speech therapy and nutrition one, another, I had all these other ones, but this one was going to be it. So how long have you had your current one? Um, since 2018. Okay. Yeah. And so that was, yeah. So then I started building my Instagram and at the beginning, it was it's totally different than what it looks like now. Very, very different. And um, that's always important to remember that things evolve. I always wanted to be like, oh, I just want to have it look exactly like this person's. It, it doesn't happen overnight. I'm very, I have uh, a lot of perfectionistic tendencies. And so I can be really hard on myself and I demand a lot of excellence from myself immediately. But it was about finding like what content resonated with people. And so one of the things that I think was I learned right away was that I wanted to create content that was shareable because the more people shared your content, the more people followed you. And the reason why someone would share your content, I thought, or I think, is that it's either something that they heartily agree with, like, yes, I agree with this too, and I want to tell everybody that this is what I think, or you just totally blew their mind of like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that being hangry and carrying granola bars in my purse were traits of blood sugar issues. Mm. Like I always thought they were personality traits, not symptoms of blood sugar stuff. So I want to help sort of like blow people's minds and make them realize, oh my goodness, that's what connects all these things is that my blood sugar, what? I didn't, I didn't think I had to think about that. And so that's, what creates this shareable content and that's how I started growing my Instagram and well before I had 10,000 followers I mean I was have I had like 4,000 followers and I was able to quit my job so it really doesn't have to do with the number of followers you have although that is a vanity metric that I still am concerned with (laughs) but um it's it's really having to do with getting the right people and attracting the right people and having those like loyal people who they are like, you read my mind. I feel like you had a camera in my house and you were following me and you said everything that I do, your story is my story. And they feel like you get them. And that's what I wanted to make people feel. I wanted to make them feel understood, seen, and that, hey, I was once there too, and I'm not there anymore. And you can also feel so much better. So that was a lot of what I did was putting out this stuff on Instagram to help people not feel so alone. Well, you're one of the most relatable people I've ever met. I'd be curious on a scale of like zero to 10, uh, no empathy, obnoxiously empathetic. Where do you land on that scale? Oh, I'm 
so empathetic. I cry so easily on my coaching calls <laughs> on, I mean, I, it's, it's a little bit much like, you know, those like highly sensitive people. Mm -hmm. If you look at some lists, go on Instagram, find a post of traits of highly sensitive people. I'm every single one. <laughs> <laughs> I have been told by many people, oh my gosh, you're so sensitive. And then everybody in the room turns around. They're like, oh my gosh, yes. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that sensitivity, empathy. Yeah, I, I really like people's suffering. Really, I feel it so much. And I just, I don't want them to feel that way. And again, borderline codependent sure. type, type stuff. <laughs> but yeah. Somebody was telling me that it's uh it's common for people that get into healthcare to uh they they basically they want to put themselves in a position of need that's why they get into healthcare which i found mm -hmm. a really interesting way to look at it is like they don't feel wanted so they put themselves in a position of need people need them essentially i thought that was really interesting i i probably fall into that category <laughs> yeah it makes you feel help like but i like to feel like i'm helping people totally. it's it's good for them i like to help them but it also is this egoic thing where mm. it's like yay i got to help them totally. but i've learned that i'm so like i feel that that piece has evolved so much since i've been doing this work that I don't need to take credit. I'm not taking credit for anyone's healing. I just want to, what the whole speech therapy thing helped me realize is that at the end of the day, I just, it's important for me to get this information out there. So I just want to reach as many people as I can with this information. And I want whoever needs it, whoever it resonates with, for it to land with them. And they can do whatever they want with it. It, I'm not stuck on, whereas in the past I may have been like, I really want you to take this advice. Now I really fully have this deep acceptance that you can only lead a horse to water. Mm. You know, as much as I want to help a certain client, she's struggling with, you know, self-sabotage and it's just like, damn, you know, like it's, that sucks. And I hope she gets help with the self-sabotage piece because I can't really help with that. But it's like, at least I did, she knows, you mm. know, what is quote, some things that will help her. And that's where I can hang my hat on that. Um, I'm going to apologize to the listeners. I'm going to ask them to stick with me for a second. Do you watch scary movies? No, I cannot watch anything scary, anything remotely um, that has suspense at all. <laughs> at all. I could do a haunted house and like rides, like things that like adrenaline because it's over, but I can't watch anything bad. No. Okay. Oh, you know me too well. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know my type. <laughs> well, I do only because you're a lot like my girlfriend. And so a lot of the things that you're talking about and describing is very much so making me think of my girlfriend. She's a chiropractor. And so she's a total... We should hang out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not watch scary movies. <laughs> Happy things. We <laughs> Disney movies. Okay, we were. Do you know what IMDb is? The of web? course. Yeah. Oh, so, so we were going through the list of like top movies, and I'm like naming all these movies that I've like I love. They're like my favorite movies. She's never seen them. None of them. No, <laughs> no, no, no. We haven't seen them. No, we haven't. <laughs> and I was like, "What are yours?" And she's like, "Oh, like Moana, or like Sing, or I love up, Sing. Or I love up. like I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, Broadway. Yeah. Also. Yes. Nice. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I used to watch there there's a couple of movies that my wife will be like, you've seen that movie? Like Requiem for a Dream. She's like, you have seen that movie? I'm like, I was daring in high school. It was before I knew what I could handle. There were certain <laughs> things. And now I'm just like, I would never choose to watch that again. It's it's too much in my body. I deal with enough anxiety as it is. I don't need to like watch something because I get the visions of it after. Like I close my eyes and I can see the Poseidon adventure. Like brandished in my mind titanic i was hiding under my jacket in the movie theater in 1998 like it, it scars me like i can't i can't do it <laughs> you're exactly like my girlfriend this is crazy to me <laughs> yeah um okay so i want to circle back to what you were talking about about the instagram piece of sure. um talking about things that like really get people excited shocked and awed like you're speaking my language you're relating to me yeah um how do you figure that out? If somebody else was like, okay, I understand content creation's great. It's how you got a lot of your clients. What would you tell them if they were trying to do that themselves? So I think that comes down to getting really familiar with and really specific about who you're talking to. And if it's not you a couple of years ago, then you have to come up with that like avatar or this unicorn or whatever it is, whatever you call it. 
of this person who you are trying to reach and this person who you know you can help. So the person that I am trying to reach was myself several years ago. So I know all the things I was thinking. I know all the things that I didn't know and how shocked I was to find it out and what I wish I had scrolled across on Instagram at that time when I was struggling because, I mean, even my doctors miss stuff about my blood sugar issues. Like I was severely hypoglycemic. I almost passed out in on the streets of Miami Beach after I got fasting blood work. My head felt like a balloon. I literally stepped backwards and was like, I almost fell over just <laughs> in the street, passed out. And I, my blood sugar ended up being 60 at that test and no doctor said anything to me. Yeah. Here I am coming in for PCOS and I'm trying to get to the root of it and no one says anything because it's below 100. So I feel like, yes, there's people with blood sugar issues that I want to reach, but now I'm starting to target more people with hypoglycemia who they're getting missed by their doctors all the time because they don't have high fasting blood sugar. They're not getting flagged for prediabetes or diabetes, which is the only two things your doctor's looking for. So it's just, it. I, I know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so I try to share that information like, hey, Danny, wouldn't this have been good to know? <laughs> and so, yeah, getting really clear on who it is that you're talking to and what it is that they need to hear to identify a lot of times, like I help people identify that they have a problem or identify or put words to or a, some sort of label on what they're going through. And that's really validating for people. I think that we all want to know those kind of things. And we're, a lot of people are looking for those answers. Because I admittedly, I always do quite a bit of research on my guests. And I was scrolling through a lot of your old posts. And you're very curated like you have a lot of great content and it seems to be and i'm just bringing this up for like mm -hmm. the listeners um do you find that you talk about a lot of the same things kind of over and over again in just like different ways to help people to help people resonate with it there are some things well one of the reasons why i repeat posts um which is something i didn't know i could do on instagram right. a while back um first off it saves time and i put a lot of work into the posts and it's like you know what not everybody i get like Let's say I get 600 new followers. They haven't seen that post. So I post it again and you get people saying the same thing. So those like heavy hitters going into your Instagram insights, looking at those, looking at the ones that did well, and every so often bringing those back up to the front and you get a bunch of thousands of people liking this and commenting. And it's like, I can't believe this post is doing well again. But I'm telling you, all the people who are seeing your account because of this stinking algorithm on Instagram, it's going to be different people every time. So I do find that I repeat themes because I think that if you don't do that and you're always trying to teach something new, you're you're actually not doing your audience a, like the right, you're not doing right by your audience because there's specific principles of certain things that I always want to be teaching people. So a lot of things are like, for example, I want to be teaching about what are the early symptoms of blood sugar issues? What are the later symptoms of blood sugar issues? Um, what are some numbers about like, what would my numbers be? What should my blood sugar do after a meal? I want to help people identify like what is right? What is off? What is it that I'm feeling? And then I want to give support. So like, here are some great foods that won't spike your blood sugar. Here are like, here's how I build a plan plate here like so giving tips and then starting and then that's where I can kind of like if we're thinking about like a niche I'm thinking about everything has to do with blood sugar but also then everything can sort of as long as I tie it into blood sugar it's still relevant for my audience so I have a whole program about optimizing your digestion but it's called optimize your digestion for low carb diets mm. and it's because Every person who I'm telling, okay, you need to eat more fat and protein, a lot of people do this and they're like, oh my gosh, I haven't gone to the bathroom in a week or I keep running to the bathroom after my meals or I feel I don't have a gallbladder or this feel like I'm getting heartburn. So the change in what I'm asking them to do often leads to digestive issues or there were digestive issues to begin with. And so if I say like, you know, fat is your blood sugar's best friend, I'm going to post that. And then the next day, I'm going to post something like, here are some signs that you're not digesting fat well. And so I can talk about digestion and kind of pull that in mm. and like sort of predict where my audience is going to go. And a lot of times, 
you can get ideas for next the next post to post because you get all these questions in the comment. You post one thing and you think you've said it all and then there's all these questions like, well, what happens at this and I don't have this and, and this doesn't work for me. And then so you can look at those things and just make another post about it. So that's sort of how you get to like you can create content is that sort of proactive content of where you think they're going to be going. So I'm glad you hit on that because I think most of the better quote unquote content creators that I know, I have found that they say the same handful of things. They just reword it. They write it in a different way. They find unique ways. They find unique perspectives. Maybe they re change the video or the text and maybe they turn it to an audio, whatever the case might be. I've just found that it's often you're iterating the same things over and over again, but it's not always going to resonate with everybody. So like tweaking it a little bit, changing a little bit, or even reposting it is a good way to just show people of like, yo, I want to make sure I get this point across and I'm going to take it from different angles. The other thing that is a really great thing to do is that was sparked from what you're saying is if let's say I make a carousel post and it's about a certain topic, then I can make a reel about it. Mm. Then I can make an infographic about it. So yep. you can make all different types of content. You can go on an IG live, talk about it longer. I could make a podcast about it. So you can have the same concepts and you can sort of flesh them out in different ways in different forms of content. Um, but the other thing you were saying, it. the other thing I wanted to say based on what you just said is that I also think that that reminded me of people sort of sticking with like kind of saying the same things and like not doing too much, it, like not giving away quote unquote too much. Mm. And I think that is something that, you know, I think it's some a line that we all need to figure out what feels comfortable for ourselves. But my Instagram page is a huge resource for anyone with blood sugar issues. I almost feel like you can go on there and you, if you can figure this out, like do it on your own, you'll be able to fix a lot of stuff on your own just from that, just from my podcast. And I felt personally that it was important for me to put out like a lot of this information, like almost everything that I know because I was so helped from other people doing that in the past. I healed myself from doing that. So I think it's a really important thing to pay it forward. And I know that not everyone can afford it and whatever. So I, it feels good for me to share a lot of information instead of feeling like I should be paid for this. Whereas I feel like what I want instead, what feels better in my body is I want to give away so much for free that it feels really fair and easy for me to ask people like, oh, if you, you need extra help beyond that? Sure, I have some offerings for you. And absolutely, if you come into my group coaching program, I'd love to coach you and answer all your questions. And it makes it not feel as like salesy for me because that's always something that I wanted to avoid feeling salesy. And so instead I can feel like, oh, that didn't help. Like I can happily solve your problem here. And if you wanna go deeper, then you can just pay me. And that feel, it felt really easy to receive that. I love that so much. I actually was on a client call uh, a couple of days ago and he was like, he's like, yeah, I was like looking at your, your social media and your website. And I, and I noticed there's, there's all these like downloadable PDFs and everything. And he's like, but there was really nothing for me to like contact you or book a call. And he's like, what's the deal with that? And I, and I do marketing. And I was like, yeah, that's intentional. I was like, I literally just want you to come into my world, consume all of my content, learn as much as humanly possible. And then I don't feel like I have to sell you because then at some point you're going to be like, yo, I need help with this stuff. And you're going to figure out how to find me essentially. Yeah. So that's totally the approach that I take. So yeah. I totally get it. Yeah. I'm currently making a program and I, I wanted to sell it because it's a lot of great information, but I realized that it actually needs to be my freebie. So it's this whole course. It's a whole course. It's great. I just recorded the whole thing. I'm super excited about it. But I want people to self-identify. Totally. I want them to identify that they have these issues. And I want to deliver high-quality free content because then they're like, oh, my gosh, she's giving away this for free? What's in the paid class, <laughs> you know? So that's another thing. It's like I always want things to be high value and make people feel that no matter how much they're paying me, or if it's not anything that they're that they can come to my page or my account somehow and feel like they're getting quality and it's a like a hub of information and that makes it so shareable. So if you think about like, oh, 
my so-and-so, like my client will be like, oh, my um, mother-in-law was having these issues. So I sent her your page. Like that, I love that kind of thing because it's like, yes, thank you so much because they just feel like, oh, that she knows what she's talking about with this and she can help with that. And that's what I want to provide, you know? That's my mission. <laughs> Do you ever get sick of talking about blood sugar? I haven't yet, which is surprising. I feel like it's going to happen. Mm. Um, but And that's why I'm excited to do this and talk business because I also love talking about business and mm -hmm. I don't feel like I do it as much. But I have not gotten sick of it yet, which is a good thing. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. I mean, Thank I feel... Goodness. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like... It, just for retrospect anyways, like you can always pivot. I always had to remind clients of that just from a marketing standpoint is like the whole like niching down and like talking about blood sugar. It's like, listen, you can always change your mind. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> yeah, you're a human. It's okay. Like, yeah. You can change your mind. And it's I'm like, always learning. So what I'm teaching about is so different from when I was teaching about blood sugar earlier. So I say the words blood sugar all the time, but now I'm learning about circadian stuff. So I'm learning about quantum circadian strategies for blood sugar. I'm talking about digestion. Like there's so many other avenues that I'm talking about and like also focusing on hypoglycemia and reactive hypoglycemia. So there's just within the blood sugar realm, it's big enough for me to like have these little outlets of, you know, if I had to talk about like doing the keto diet all day, I would be sick of that. I definitely would be. I'm sick of talking about keto for sure. <laughs> and for anyone listening, I firmly believe that should only be a tool. And that's not, not something I knew at the beginning. So I also talk about things where I've changed my mind or I've learned something new. Um, and I think that anytime you are authentic with your audience, I think it really um, it, it's really well received. I've seen a shocking number of people actually sort of gravitate away from the keto thing, even to the point where like, did you go to KetoCon this last year? Yeah, I spoke at KetoCon the last two years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they changed it to Hack Your Health. Yeah. So I think there's, there's and not that, again, I think it's a great tool, but I think a lot of people aren't thinking it's like the answer to everything anymore. Exactly. So, so yeah, and I, I'm glad they're not thinking that. Like, I'm glad sort of the way it's going, but I think that they're, of course, needs to be more nuanced to the conversation, which there always does, that <clears throat> it's just like fasting, just like cold plunging. Everything is a tool. Totally. Like these are all tools and we don't hang our hat on a tool. We don't stay using one tool for the rest of our lives because it's not going to work out. So that's what I want people to realize is that we're building a box of tools and we can take out the fasting tool sometimes and put it away sometimes because our body's overly stressed or whatever it is and so if we can learn to dip into these things when we need them and put them away when we need them and learn to have variety and like we live on a cyclical planet uh women are cyclical you know we have cyclical months and so having this variety if we're able to do that i think that's what people a lot of people are missing in there they want to find the one thing that works and it's they're going to keep doing it into the ground i mean that was me with paleo i just found paleo and i had pcos and i developed pcos while i was eating paleo even though it just healed a bunch of things and i was like well i guess i'll just paleo harder because i didn't <laughs> know what to do so we use these tools like we run them into the ground and it's like you, you need to switch things up <laughs> you know I love that analogy a lot. I've never thought about this until we we're just talking it now on the podcast show, but I actually see the exact same thing with as somebody who does marketing is that so often I think we're like, what is the best social media platform? Is it Instagram? Is it TikTok? Is it Facebook? Or like, what's the best funnel? And it's always like, I think it, they're just tools. Yeah. Really at the end of the day. And it really depends. And they ebb and flow depending upon your needs. Yeah. And I think that if like asking like what's the best x like you're this is the wrong question to right. ask i think you know like if someone's hung up on where should i start you know what social media platform should i start on i will say that when i started on instagram it was way easier to grow my audience than totally. it is now totally. it is very hard now my my audience is going up little by little so little um but it it's fine letting it go but it doesn't mean I'm going to like jump ship and run to TikTok. I know Instagram. I know millennials are not getting off of Instagram. I know because I'm one. I'm not getting off Instagram. Sorry. <laughs> so I know that my audience is still going to be there. If the algorithm changes, it doesn't mean, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. It's not going to work. It's like, okay, maybe learn some new strategies, but also maybe it's time to diversify. So now I'm working on adding a YouTube channel. So I'm going to start doing content on YouTube. 
might start doing TikTok. Still not super called to it. So I don't want to, like, this is my business. I want to like what I'm doing. And so I feel good about YouTube. I feel like there's probably a lot of trolls on YouTube that I'll have to get ready for, but that's okay. But otherwise, like, I just don't, I don't really know TikTok. So just because it's like blowing up, it doesn't mean I have to do that because it doesn't feel good for me. Totally. So it's like also go with what feels right to you or what you know. If you know Instagram if, because you've been on that freaking app since 2012, then stay on Instagram. Make an Instagram account. I also really like to make infographics. I like to make carousel posts. I like to have the written word. I'm not as much into video because that means I have to take a shower. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, that's a, that's a, you know, hashtag entrepreneur working from home problem. It's like, oh, I have to get ready and do my hair. I will do that once a week. No, twice a week. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> but I'm just saying that there's like certain types of content. Like I could get lost designing in Canva all day. That feels fun to me. I haven't outsourced that yet because I really like it. Totally. So if there's certain pieces of your business or certain things that you're sort of more drawn to or an app that you use that you know about, go with that. Don't go for like the best one just because everyone says it. Like I think that there's so much more to be said about your personality and what feels right with you. Like stick with that. I often use the rule of 100 when people are asking me that question is like, what is the medium that you can use that you could do 100 of them? Could you write 100 blogs? Could you do 100 videos? Could you write 100 posts? Could you do 100 Canva infographics? Like, what is the one that you could do 100? Great. And then even then, after the 100, you can reevaluate. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Maybe it didn't work. Maybe it did work. So I like that rule for that. Yeah, that's a really great rule. Yep. Um, I have a round of rapid fire questions for you. Let's do it. It's whatever the first thing is that comes to mind. Okay. What's your best business advice? Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I threw a think, big one at you. I think um, getting your messaging right, that it's not too jargony. I, okay, this is one thing I learned from speech therapy. I used to try to have to talk to the parents, and I had to not use jargon mm. when I was talking to them about, you know, lateral lisps and phonetic processes and all the phonological processes. It's been a while. So... Um, speaking to people in a way that they hear you, getting your messaging right, not using things that are over people's head. Like I'm talking about insulin and blood sugar. It's hard to understand. That's why I didn't learn about it to begin with because it was boring and hard to understand. And I have tried to make that as easy as possible to understand. So people aren't like glazing over when I'm talking. They're like, oh my gosh, this is so interesting. I want to get a CGM. Like I want to pay attention to this. You know, they mm. want to do it. They're excited about it. So getting that messaging right where you feel like the right people are hearing you. Good advice. What's your favorite part about entrepreneurship? Not having to take showers. <laughs> um, not having to wake up to an alarm, not having to like I thought about this the other day, just, I'm like, I'm in my kitchen, it's 10 a.m., having a slow start to my morning, and it doesn't matter. Like, it's so cool <laughs> to not have to be anywhere at a certain time. It's really freeing. <laughs> I haven't had an alarm for years, with the exception of when I had to travel back and forth from Italy and not miss a flight, but that's a whole other game. Yeah. Uh, when are you the most productive? This has been a hard thing for me to figure out. Um, getting out of mold when in my Florida house has really helped my brain be on. I didn't realize how dulled it was. Um, because of that, I was noticing allergy symptoms, weight gain symptoms because of what it does to your leptin. But I, it was also totally, um, and my wife said, it just made everything hard. It made everything feel like a chore. So now that my brain is back online, I would say that I'm probably most productive. Is that what you said? Um, in the late morning and um, I also really like my treadmill desk for increasing productivity really helpful because then I'm it, it makes me feel like I'm working right like I'm not sitting and like accidentally being on my phone um, I'm more like okay I'm walking like what do I want to get done because mm. I've made that decision so that's super helpful have you heard of lateral eye movement uh, only with like EMDR therapy but i know that it comes from walking right yeah i've always thought and we don't have to dive into this it's just a random thought with Corey moment but i've always thought that one of the benefits of going on a walk is the lateral eye movement of things going by you and it gets your brain moving forward i always wondered they should make like a treadmill that has like screens yeah <laughs> right like stuff going by your eyes like as if you were actually walking i'm sure someone probably already has or is figuring that out now but 
I don't know. Random thoughts with Corey. Uh, who, is your, who is your inspiration? Who is my inspiration currently? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I know that my past inspiration was Diane Sanfilippo. She was really inspirational for me. Um, now that your buddies, you're kind of like... Hmm. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> hmm. Which is fine. It could be yourself in five years. I don't know. I mean... I, I, I'm sorry. I just don't have an answer for this. Cool. Yeah. What's your best marketing advice? Marketing. I don't know about marketing. <laughs> this is, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't really know about marketing. Do I know? What do I know? Uh, I would say yours is obviously more of the content realm. So I would say probably, um, empathy, listening, paying attention, mm. creating a message that actually resonates with people, getting yeah. people to feel something. Yeah. I'm just speaking I guess for I you. Don't, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, literally, there's so many things I don't know about business. Like, I don't know what falls under marketing. <laughs> That's, I mean. Content, running ads, emails, videos. Emails. Um, okay. Yeah, I think the making content stuff and, yeah, yeah like, making people feel seen and heard. I totally think that's, okay. I figured that's what you were going to say. Anyway, okay, so. yeah. Uh, tell me one secret or something most people don't know about you. About me? Que habla español. Okay, there we go. <laughs> where, did you learn that as a child or what? No. I studied abroad in Buenos Aires, and I, I just took Spanish in like middle school and high school, and then I got a dual degree uh, in speech language pathology and Spanish, and so when I was in college, I got that degree in Spanish and had to take all these classes. Like, I had to take like um, Historia y Cultura de Latinoamérica, and like I had to write poetry and term papers and all these things in Spanish. It was like doing like an English lit degree in Spanish. It was insane. I was like, dude, I just want to learn how to talk. <laughs> like, I just want to have a conversation. And then uh, I lived in Miami for 12 years, and that really helped my ability to speak. That's que cool. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and I could do a lot of uh, accents in Spanish. So, um, like, I could do Cuban, Mexican, Argentinian. So. And you learned this by working in Miami? Yeah, a lot of it. Working in Miami, studying abroad, a lot of friends who spoke Spanish. Um, I have uh, some good friends still in Ecuador. So, yeah. I have so <laughs> many questions on that, but we got to keep going. Okay. <laughs> uh, what would you change about yourself? What would I change about myself? Mm-hmm. Ooh, um, I wish I was a little bit taller. No, um, <laughs> I'm only five feet, but that's fine. I'll stick with the five feet. Um, I... <laughs> wish that it's getting better. I wish I had a little bit better ability to focus. So that's something I'm actively working on changing. Um, and I'm doing better. Again, the mold, not being in mold helps. But I feel that so many times I procrastinate due to perfectionism mm. and also some tasks that just feel too big. And so um, I have trouble focusing and like knowing what time I'm going to be most productive and things like that. So that's kind of, it's held me back a little bit and I'm working on it. So hopefully I can come on again as a changed person. It's good (laughs) self-awareness. That's all I can say about that. When were you the happiest? Hmm. I think the year that I moved back from, I think two years are coming to mind. The year that I met my wife, 2018, when I went to nutrition school, like, and I was super excited about um, just, like, changing careers and everything, and everything I was learning. I loved the school. It was very aligned with what I was doing. And then um, a year in 2014, when I had been in New York City for, I lasted, like, six months. It was really, like, a dark time in my life, and I came back to Miami, and that's when I found, like, I found out who I was and what I liked. So I was really into nutrition. Prior to that, I was like really into, oh, this is something people don't know about me. I was really into the underground techno scene in Miami. I used to date DJs and um, was would stay up until, you know, 4 a.m., go to after hours, party, you know, that kind of stuff. Damn. And um, yeah, I just went out actually on Saturday to the concourse project and it was really fun, but I could do that now like once a quarter. <laughs> but yeah, so I was I was in that world before and then I came back 
and I had sort of figured out who I was, what I liked. I was into holistic health and I wanted to be outside and be paddle boarding and doing yoga. That's when I found acro yoga. I used to be a very avid acro yogi. I taught classes. I would be thrown up in the air doing flips and all sorts of stuff. Really, really fun. So. You have so many interesting things packed into <laughs> such a small body. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your favorite app or resource right now? Favorite app or resource? Hmm. Uh, Asana, my task management. Oh, yeah. I've been, um, I had to, you know, pay my online business manager to set that up because, you know, even though I'm an Enneagram one, we're supposed to be organized, but I didn't get that gene. And <laughs> I'm organized in my house, but not digitally. Mm. So I, it was really hard to like, I think that's a really great tip for people to get some sort of task management tool and put everything on there and lay out your business because it feels like it's sort of floating all over the place. It feels like there's all these tabs open in your mind and it's just put everything in one place instead of like in the note app, in your phone and post-its. Like, don't do that. <laughs> like, get it all into this virtual filing cabinet. That's where I feel like that's where my business lives and it's been really helpful my whole team is on there and it's great. The other expression I've heard from that one for anybody listening is uh, it's called a second brain. I can't remember who coined it, but essentially that's the philosophy behind it is basically taking like all this knowledge and information and putting it onto whether it's a notion or a sauna or whatever your app is, but like having a second brain, I think is really important. You've only been in Austin for two months, but what's your favorite part about Austin? And you can't say the people. Um, I really enjoy doing walk and talks. Oh yeah. So I love meeting up with people and walking. I love that there's a daytime culture where it's not like, let's make a dinner reservation for 8 30 PM and then go out after for drinks. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be home sleeping, <laughs> not mm. going to do that. So I love the, the opportunity to do things that are more aligned with circadian rhythm and health. When I was in Italy, that was my biggest pet peeve is like dinner starts at like eight, nine. I was like, I'm in bed. Yeah. I'm not trying to be out at dinner at 9. In Argentina, dinner's at 11 p.m. No. Yeah. Not doing it. And then we'd go out at 1 a.m. And that was a lot like that in, in Miami, too. I used to take disco naps all the time and, like, sleep until 12 and then get ready and go out. And I was still the first one there. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Nope. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah. Count me out. A hard no. <laughs> uh, I have one last question. Before I ask that question, though, I want to acknowledge you, Nanny, Danny, mm -hmm. for so many things. For packing so much goodness into a small body. For being a very empathetic person for being able to get out of speech therapy and actually pursue the passions that you want to do, for having great content on all your platforms, for having your own podcast show that's awesome as well, and for showing up today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, last Before I ask my, last my question, uh, what's your plug? Where can people find you? Um, I hang out on Instagram a lot, Danielle Hamilton Health, and my podcast is Unlock the Sugar Shackles. Sweet. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, it's really whatever your best piece of advice is. So if you were to go back to ground zero of before you started your business, maybe you're still working as a speech pathologist or you were talking to somebody in that similar circumstance, what's maybe the best piece of advice you'd give to yourself or somebody else in that situation? If you feel in your body, you need to do it, freaking do it. Like don't let anything stand in your way and, you know, take out loans, do what you need to do, keep working another job, you know, have that one be your side hustle <laughs> and don't stop because there's people out there that need you. And that's some of the, that's what kind of helps me sometimes get through perfectionism is that like, if I'm sitting here scrolling on my phone and avoiding what I have to do, I'm not helping people. I'm not in integrity. And so if you feel really called to be out there helping people and knowing that even you, like, even if you just change I'm going to cry for some reason. Like one person's life, it's worth it. I don't know why I just got choked up. Um, it's <laughs> There it is. Yeah, there's the empathy. <laughs> Even if you just change one person's life, I feel like it's worth it. And I feel like we all know something that is enough to help other people. Like don't underestimate yourself that like comparing this person knows more than me. Every, there's a lot of people out there that know more than me. But there's something that you have that's unique. Like you can reach a certain person in a special way and – the like getting out of that comparison mind like focus on your eyes on your own journey because you're wasting time <laughs> so yeah. love that thank you danny yeah, thanks for being on the show appreciate it 
Hey friend, thanks for listening to the show. And if you have any feedback for me about the show or any other guests that you'd want to see in the show, definitely shoot me a message. I love engaging with my audience and figuring out how I can provide the best value possible to the people listening to this show. Before you go, I only have one ask of you and that would be to check out my three tips Tuesday newsletter. It's three marketing tips every Tuesday specifically for the health and fitness entrepreneur to help them attract new leads. If you press the link in the description, it'll take you directly to the archive of all my previous newsletters and you can decide for yourself if it's something for you. If you end up finding it helpful, you can just sign up for the newsletter and you'll get it in your inbox every Tuesday. Thanks again and keep hustling, my friends.